Welcome back to Infinite Scroll. I'm Lauren. I'm Jordi, and we're the co-founders of Gen Z digital media brand Centennial World. And these are the biggest stories on the internet this week. But first... <laughs> a little croaky today, are we? A little bit croaky. I actually probably... Harry had to leave for work this morning. So for some context, actually, before I start getting into why we feel this way, mm. why I feel this way, Harry set his alarm for 4 a.m. this morning. Oh, my God. To go and clean the factory before work. Oh. Because he realised he completely forgot that that was something he should probably do. Yeah, yeah. So Harry and I had our respective bachelorette, bachelor, hens, bucks night Mm. on Saturday night. So we are a little bit worse for wear. (laughs) We're also recording on a Monday, which is kind of like a double whammy in the scheme of, you know, unwellness. But yeah, Harry left at 4am this morning. Because his bucks was in his company's warehouse, which is why he had to clean it for context. (laughs) And he'd been setting up for days and his bosses, they love to throw a party. So they were really excited. They Mm -hmm. just moved into a new factory uh, that they'd bought like almost for the purpose of it's huge for decking it out into like kind of a bachelor pad like it has like a full built-in bar has a pool table it has like a bazillion tv screen so it actually kind of is a substitute for a sports bar Mm -hmm. they had a big kind of like barbecue moment happening so I think for Harry in his mind it was just kind of a more affordable way that he could have all of his friends in one place Totally love that for him, but I'm sure the state of that place made his bosses wish they had never said yes. 100%. He got there this morning and he called me freaking out. He said, did the bag of clothes that I took to the box make it home? And I was like, I don't know. I'm in the Mm. shower. Like I'll call you back in a minute. Um, He said, because I just found the lid snapped off of my perfume bottle. Oh, my God. In the factory, like on the floor. He was like, I'm not sure what the fate of my bag is if I can only find the lid to my perfume Oh, no. And I actually did find his clothes. Everything made it home in one piece. The reason he wasn't home in his clothes is because he had to change into like a wig and a dress, like all op shop clothing. It was the most heinous like (laughs) concoction of clothes. One of his bosses brought his wife's undies for Harry to try and fit into. And Harry was like, that's the weirdest thing that anyone's ever (laughs) requested me to do. I feel really bad for Elle. She's also like a size six. Like she's so tiny. He was like, I couldn't even get over my knees. (laughs) I got home from the hen's night and he was passed out on the couch in this full get up that they mm. put him in. I had to check that it was him before I like rolled him over because honestly it could have been anyone. Like <laughs> this disgusting blonde wig. <laughs> he had lipstick all over his face. There was of course like penises drawn all over him in red lipstick. <laughs> and I just ended up like getting all this makeup remover, like scrubbing his fa- face before I went to bed because I was like, you're going to get red lipstick all over our couch, yeah, yeah. all over our bed. Like I'm not mothering you. I'm just yeah. like taking care of our shit. And then in the morning that was just just like the um, micellar water, like mm. cotton pads all over the house. Oh like it was a train wreck. And then his dad was so unwell because his dad came down for the weekend and is staying with us that he didn't get out of bed until like maybe 2 p.m. <laughs> And it's just such dad behavior that he kept blaming the humidity oh for my why God. he was feeling so unwell. He's like, no, you just were very drunk yesterday, Don. You just <laughs> moved on to Bundy and Cokes at like, <laughs> yeah. like 8 p.m. That's never going to go down well. And I had to go and post my dress back and he went to go and get something for dinner at the same time. So he came back with the world's biggest packet of ravioli. He'd walked like 500 meters to the shops and back. Once he sat back down on the couch after going grocery shopping to get us dinner, he couldn't even like stand up to cook it. Like he needed like a rest (laughs) and then legitimately just went straight back to bed. Oh my God. After he ate, like he literally was awake for like two hours. Maybe Harry and I went to my parents' house the next day, had a quick little swim, went and saw my sisters and their partners. We were all asleep on the ground at like a different (laughs) part of the house I didn't know mum was sending photos in to like the bride group yes, that I wasn't a part I was of dead I was like why is her mom sending pictures of her I thought you were in your bra and underwear and I was like this is kind of like inappropriate and you're like no those are my sweaters I've just been like we've just been kind of swimming to make ourselves feel better my sister ordered like a hundred dollars worth of donut king like all these thick shakes cinnamon donuts my so mom and dad good. weren't hung over at all and I'm so yeah. jealous of them like yeah. seeing people feeling just like doing errands and yeah, doing yeah normal Sunday things when you feel like that is just like cruel yeah yeah yeah. mom and dad then ordered Chago Charlie's Mm. for lunch for everyone and no one could touch it oh my god I felt so bad (laughs) 
But essentially, sign of a good night, my sisters like absolutely knocked it out of the park because I didn't know anything. I'd given them a few like tidbits of what I really wanted and I wanted like a lunch somewhere Mm -hmm. and then I wanted like games. Yeah. But not like games like dressing people up in toilet paper, wedding dress, like that's my nightmare. Um, They just did like a few quizzes, which was so much fun. We had lunch at a restaurant in Surrey Hills called Amarika and it was, we ended up in a private dining room, Mm -hmm. which I was literally like about to burst into tears when I walked in. It was like the bougiest, most amazing thing ever. I can't believe like how perfect everything was considering I had no idea what was going on. We were eating like caviar filled donuts, like brie and caviar filled donuts. And the boys were like all dressed up in like op shop clothing, eating like (laughs) sausage sandwiches in a factory. It was like, could not be (gasps) further apart with how our days ended up panning out. And then we went to the dolphin in Surrey Hills and just played a bunch of games. Games. I lost almost every round of every game and I yeah. think I'd done like 14 limoncello <laughs> shots by the end of the night which is why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling and then we went dancing at the Beresford but the Beresford closes so early oh does it it was like same with Crystal's hands when we went there to dance oh yeah I forgot about that yeah they just turned the lights on oh, at yeah. like 1 a.m and yeah. then kick you out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we had just, with Crystals, we had just got there. Yeah. And we were so upset, I remember. It was the same. We got like maybe half an hour there. Yeah. The music was so good. It was so fun. I actually have to show you a photo of my shoes. Look at what my shoes looked like. Oh, no. And I was so anxious yesterday. I could not check what state the dress was yeah, in because yeah. I rented the dress. The yeah, dress yeah. was fine. I was so nervous about my bag because it was like this bag that I'd gotten on sale that I was obsessed with and I was so scared. I just had absolutely destroyed it. Yeah, yeah. Look at my shoes. Oh my god, they're <laughs> like I have to throw them out. Yeah, they're so. Wait, where did you get them from? They're just from Zara. Okay, okay. So not the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. It was like not a fast fashion girly. Try not to be, but this is why. Oh my! I have god. to throw them in the bin. I'm so upset. I might reorder them because I love them. Uh, but it meant that when we got kicked out of the Beresford, we tried to do karaoke on the way home, mm. and he was like, "No." You can't come in. We're oh. about to close. Oh, yeah. And also, you bitches are so drunk. Like, just <laughs> go home. And then we sat in the line at the McDonald's in Brookvale for, like, an hour. Maybe. Oh, my God. Because obviously that's where everyone's stopping. So that was, like, very unwell. So all in all, like, the most perfect, fun, amazing yes. day ever. It probably will feel worth it maybe tomorrow when yes. I feel like a back to myself yeah. but like obviously we're just I'm like in this processing moment but the girls <laughs> like did so well knocked it out of the park this processing moment. <laughs> absolutely thrilled need to sleep for about four days yeah and then we'll have my mom's organized a bridal shower on Saturday with like my grandma and my aunties and stuff so that would be much more civilized <laughs> but the goal is to feel better by that you will by Saturday you'll feel better by <laughs> Saturday I hope it's Monday <laughs> also after not drinking for like a yes. couple of months I was really really anxious about the drinking of it mm-hmm. all and I just had to you know lean in lean in I was like this is the moment like this is yeah. the part that I was kind of building up to and then you just have to acknowledge that you're gonna feel shit and accept that it's going to be worth it and then you won't feel shit again. The bridal shower won't be, you know, a big drinking day. The wedding, I think you just are so busy on the day that you're not drinking the same amount. You're not doing 14 limoncello shots so it should be fine. (laughs) Um, But I really think like this is the fun, most fun moment with the worst repercussions. (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, you just have to lean in these next couple months. Like you said, like obviously your hens was big and then the the events leading up to the wedding and then your honeymoon and then just know like these will be like a really fun couple months, but kind of unwell yes. and then you'll be fine. And then you can just like, I can just spend March like resetting yeah. if I want to and like not drinking. I was trying really hard to just drink intuitively mm-hmm. and just be like, if I want another drink, I'll get yeah. another drink. If I don't want another drink, I won't get another drink. I had a hydrolyte at lunch yeah. and then I had a hydrolyte, like as soon as we sat down, there was mm-hmm. hydrolytes like on our place settings the girls also made these tattoos of harry's oh, yes. face which i scrubbed off this morning i was scrubbing my wrist within an inch of its life it had disintegrated into the most disgusting yes. version of anything i've ever seen it was like just dirt imprinted yes. on my arm mine was literally so yesterday i was i woke up and i was like okay i need to get this off so i scrubbed like the ink came off but yes. the stickiness was yeah. still there like in a huge so i was just going throughout the day with like this thing sticking to my arm like it just was sticking to my all my clothes and everything and then by you know like the end of the day because it'd been sticking on so many things it was like black with like yes. fuzz so it wasn't sticky anymore and I was like I need to get this off so I spent like an hour peeling it off 
off like little by little. Yes, yeah, so you just have to like scratch it, which is like so <laughs> yes. painful for you. Maddie just fully nail polish removed. I know. Her skin. Like Lex had it on her butt. Bella had it on her boob. <laughs> like imagine trying to scratch off on your butt like that. No. Like at least this was something I could just be like yeah. sitting there like working away at if I yeah, needed yeah. to. But I was like, it's like when you have all your club wristbands or stamps yes. on and you just, you know, when you're in university or, you know, you just turned 18 and you like wear them as like a badge of honor. Yes. And I was like, if I'm going to get through a normal work week, yeah, yeah. I have to pretend that I'm okay to like convince myself that I am okay. <laughs> You're like, I can't have this on my own. I cannot. I almost <laughs> wanted to keep it so I could show you guys on YouTube how disgusting oh it looked. But I was like, I will not be able to like convince myself to show up and be like a professional functioning yeah. girly if I still have this on my arm. So yeah, everything like went as well as it possibly could have I don't know how Don's gonna get through today <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's the thing even Sean like I was saying so I left at the dolphin when the dolphin I thought you guys were like wrapping up but I guess not <laughs> um so I left around like 9 30 I think it was and I got home I watched two episodes of Housewives with Nick to like decompress and then I went to bed around like 12 and that's like pretty late for me if I'm not drinking or whatever. And then Sean got home, I think around like two and he was just like stumbling around the room trying to get his shit together. So it was probably like three by the time I fell back to sleep because it took him like 30 to 45 minutes to like settle in. And then obviously because he'd had such a big day of drinking, he was just tossing and turning the whole night. And I was like, oh my God, why? Like I should have just drank because I feel just as tired on yeah, Sunday completely. after this. No, but like you have lost sight of what you actually would have felt like. True, actually. <laughs> like I was feeling tired and feeling the way that I felt. Like I have had some bad hangovers in my yeah. life for sure. We actually joke, my cousin Maddie one time for Danny's, like one of our other really good friends for her 25th birthday, we rented a house down in Berry, and we just had like a big picnic. Like it mm. started so civilized and stunning. Maddie used to go really hard when she was like underage. And so mm. by the time she was like 24, she was a like, full grandma. Like she yeah, doesn't yeah. go out anymore. <laughs> like, you know, she's very conservative with how yeah. much she drinks. And that's just her, like, she's a mom. Like she's had mom energy for a long time. She checked herself into hospital. Like she literally took herself to the emergency room on the way back from Barry because she was so hungover. Oh my God. And I was like, guys, I was one like second away from pulling a Maddie and checking myself into hospital. I felt so horrifically hungover. And because I was trying to get everyone to send like photos in from the day because I didn't have anything. I barely touched my phone. And the jump scare, I was like, I need to post something on Instagram because I need the serotonin, like yes. I need the dopamine boost <laughs> of like the likes. Instagram likes rolling in. But when I went to open Instagram, it opened on my front camera and like trying to post <laughs> a glam shot from yesterday versus what my front camera was showing me was like the biggest jump scare I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I wish I had the balls to post what I looked yeah, like yeah, yeah. because it was just like the comparison was completely unhinged. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's so funny. It's so good. They had so much fun though, and it was honestly like perfect. The lunch was exactly your vibe. Like oh it was God. literally perfect. It was perfect. So I'm so sad it's over. And that's yeah. what everyone was saying. It's like the wedding is a couple of days long that we're bullying everyone into because it is so right that mm. the day comes and goes so fast. Yeah. And I was like, if I didn't have this seedy headache, yeah, yeah, yeah. like it would almost feel like it was a dream and it all comes and goes and you yeah. like you never even when you think you're appreciating it, appreciating it in the moment it never feels like you are yeah so I feel like that was a really good taster for how much I truly need to like savor yeah. everything moving forward because then your bright era just comes and goes and totally. you never get that again yeah. and well, you just you might <laughs> In theory, <laughs> in theory. And Harry was the same. I was like, look, you only have to do it once because he was so anxious about yeah. being hungover as yeah, well. Yeah. I was like, it's okay because we only do it once and the hardest part is over now because yes. we're kind of feeling better. But it was a one day thing. Yeah, like there's such polar opposite like experiences in your life, but somehow like they just need to coexist for this period of yes, time. For sure. So, well, yes. I didn't even drink and I missed my berries class yesterday morning and this morning. <laughs> So well, I'm like I'll $60 do one for down you. the tube. I will do one with you this week because I feel like I desperately need that too to get myself back on track. Maybe we can do one Thursday when we get back. Yes. Before we start our first, before we go to our first Christmas party. Oh my God, I forgot our about that. Our first brand Christmas party is this Thursday. We're going to have to pack like a dress for that. Yeah. But yes, thank you to everyone for showing up. Thank you for losing a few nights of sleep. <laughs> I will probably be spamming on Instagram just to remember yeah. that I felt 
that good yeah at a point not that far in the past <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we'll feel that good at some point again in the future <laughs> no you will it was so good you looked amazing everybody so like fun. really showed up yes. it was good Everyone, the energy like, was so it. high yes it was which was just amazing yeah and also bringing your mom to mm -hmm. a hands mm -hmm. I highly recommend because she had all the hydrolytes you know ready she was forcing mm -hmm. everyone to take it she left at a reasonable time that I think made it a feel like okay for other people to leave yeah like because Jesse left not too far after me after yeah. you um like my mom and my aunties left my cousin left so I just feel like too also speaking of the like anxiety of the drinking of it all I also think it was a really nice decision to just keep it really really small it was mm -hmm. the opposite of Harry's like moment where yeah, yeah. he like had like know, a million people different energy but it really helps easy anxiety when you realize that like every single person that was there like I could be like the biggest idiot yeah. in front of and I know that the anxiety is like I don't need to feel like that yeah, because totally. like it's all like your most trusted people that like have all been like an idiot in front of you as well yeah, yeah. so when everyone was messaging being like oh my god you know I'm spiraling I'm like guys it's fine yeah no. like who like, cares it's okay that's also like the t like a hens is the time to like send it yeah Doing the worm on the street if you want to. <laughs> no, not naming any names. Okay, so on that note, mm -hmm. we will move on <laughs> to the actual reason that you guys come here, which is viral news. Um, a reminder, if you enjoy this episode, please join our Geneva. Um, you can chat about everything we discuss, all categories of conversation. I'm going to put a photo of my shoes in there. Yes. If anyone wants to see Do like it. the unwell state that they were in, let me know if you think they're salvageable. <laughs> also, they're really pointy and like, you know, when you just like scuff up the front yeah. so badly, like maybe that makes them not salvageable. But yeah, there'll be a photo of my shoes in there. Also remember to sign up to our newsletter that comes out on a Friday. So it makes sure you can just engage with us every single day of the week, essentially at this point. Uh, and if you like this episode, please remember to leave us a review, rate, review and subscribe. They are mm -hmm. so helpful for us to grow. Uh, and I will read one review that we did get recently in Instagram DM, which is just so amazing. So Layla messaged us and said, hi, Jordi and Laura. Lauren, I'm a new ish listener and absolutely love the pod. I saw one of your TikToks come up on my For You page and it absolutely drew me in. I'm super chronically online and obsessed with internet and pop culture. So all the super niche and random drama is totally what I'm into. <laughs> Thank you so much for making a pod that deep dives and talks about my interests and things I love so well. I really appreciate you girls and the work that you do. You're both hilarious, gorgeous and incredibly smart and well-spoken and I absolutely love your voices. You guys have such a great dynamic and I hope this pod never ends. Love you girls so much oh my god thank you that is so nice that is so sweet that's what Jordy needed it really even though <laughs> the voices are gonna sound different today I hate to break it to, <laughs> to everyone you. this is not of the regular voice also when we remote record which like is something that I've always known we are a lot more chill so our voices because we're not like performing in the same way it feels True. like when we're in studio we're like we're it's not a performance but like having the camera there and all the lights it's like feels like a production yeah and I also feel like too when we're remote we're a little bit more cognizant of like yes. waiting for the other person to finish making their point true and also like we're usually recording not in like a closed space like I'll have like my family in the background or whatever because you're like at home or whatever so it's just a different vibe and so I've always known like since we've done the podcast remote recording feels like lower energy I've always thought that was a bad thing, but we got some comments last week when we had two remote episodes being like, this was so calming. Lauren's always so screechy. <laughs> No, it wasn't screamy. It was just that we were loud because yeah. I just think we get overexcited when we're making a point. It's as so well. the energy is so different when you're together versus like remote. Yes, totally. And I think like that is why we do remote episodes so infrequently yes. is because we do value that like it helps us like bounce off each other too mm -hmm. but it is really funny so we're gonna try and not be as loud on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> as annoying sorry but like it's honestly just who I am it's like the North American in me <laughs> like I'm screechy every now and again in like I don't notice it because mm -hmm. like literally we spend more time together than we do with our partners yeah. but every now and again if we're like out with the boys yeah and Sean will be like, Lauren, use your inside voice. I know. And I don't even notice it because like <laughs> that's what I function with day to day. And Sean's like, shh, 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 I know. Shh, shh. Bring the energy down like he, 10 decibels. He gets like self-conscious of me. He's like, stop <laughs> screaming in public. And I'm like, I can't help it. I like, literally don't realize. Well, it's if anyone brings up like housewives. 
then God. yes, I can't, the I can't control and the energy <laughs> increases. It's just who you are. Exactly. Uh, and then we got another review from Maddie who messaged us and said, been listening to you all for about six months now and finally getting around to finding your Insta. I love the chit chat of the pop culture updates and the deep dives are so much fun. I wonder what a deep dive into a recent trend of de-influencing would look like. Also, this is directed at specifically Geordie. I'm so glad you're off the Colleen Hoover <laughs> reading trend and would love to recommend some books so you can stay in your reading reading girl era people are so pressed that I am into Colleen Hoover I mean like as you guys are all on this journey with me like I'm realizing the era of my ways I think Colleen Hoover was just a really good gateway mm. author to get me back into reading like yeah. I said it's been a long time since I've like consistently read and she was just like very easy very mm -hmm. buzzy you could engage in discourse around her books I appreciate the fact that she is not the world's best author mm -hmm. so I am using that as my jumping off point Definitely recommend me some books for sure. Can't guarantee that I will read them because it's very hit and miss still with the consistency yes. of my reading. I am still trying to work my way through Glossy, oh, yeah. which isn't getting any better. And obviously, you know, it's a bit busy. I'm going to be consistently maybe a bit hungover in the next few weeks. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing <laughs> that I will get through any books. You can be in your reading girl era in like March. <laughs> yes. Starting in March. Or maybe, you know, I'll smash through a few books we're going up to. We're doing a few like beach days just straight after the wedding. Like oh, yeah. a few pool days just to mm -hmm. kind of decompress. And that is always planes. Yeah. Pools. Yeah. Is generally when I read. So hopefully I can catch up on a few things. But definitely send them through. And thank you so much for the kind words. I will not read any more Colleen Hoover. I promise everyone. <laughs> or if you do, you won't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I will do it in secret. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's get on to viral news. The first story. The big story of this week. The big story. Colleen Ballinger has returned to YouTube following the grooming allegations and her toxic gossip train apology. Colleen Ballinger is back after a five-month hiatus following one of the biggest online cancellations probably to date, mm -hmm. I would argue. The creator, who faced intense public scrutiny earlier this year after it was revealed that she had fostered several inappropriate relationships with young fans over the course of her career, returned to her vlog channel on November 18th with a new video titled Fall Vlog. Before getting into the video, Colleen sits down to address the allegations, including her highly criticized apology video, apology in air quotes for sure, that she posted back in June in which she strummed a ukulele and sang a song called Toxic Gossip Train about the accusations leveled against her. She said in her new video, quote, obviously the last video that I posted on here, it's really embarrassing to say the least. I was being accused of some pretty awful things and I was just mad and I should have handled the situation with maturity and empathy, but instead I just let my ego take over and I'm really disappointed in myself. Colleen admits that over the past 15 years of her career, there have been times when she was, quote, immature and inappropriate with her comedy. Quote, I did not put enough thought into my fan interactions. And because of that behavior, people got hurt. And I am so sorry. She finishes her short statement by saying she plans to put out positive content into the world and understands if her audience can't forgive her. Quote, I am not a perfect person and there are plenty of things in my past that I wish I could go back and redo. I don't have control over any of that and I don't have control over the things that people say about me. I only have control over my actions moving forward. So I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure that I create positive, kind, inclusive, sp safe space online with my content. So <laughs> I don't think anybody needs a recap on this we became like a dedicated Colleen Ballinger cancellation podcast for a little bit there so I'm sure a a lot of you guys have been on this journey or b found us through that content oh my god true found us through that journey yes but over the past five months Colleen has faced allegations of manipulation grooming and racism she was also accused of sending Trisha Paytas's OnlyFans content to minors as a way to mock her former friend and strengthen Colleen's relationships with fans the fallout from these ongoing allegations was intense and even led to statements from Colleen's former colleagues and collaborators as well as her ex-husband John Joshua David Evans. Her initial apology video, Toxic Gossip Train, was not well received as viewers felt her song made a mockery of the allegations while she avoided taking any accountability for her past actions. Okay. How do you feel about this apology? And then we'll kind of get into the response from the people that have spoken out against her. Okay. So... I actually didn't think she was ever going to address it again. I thought yeah. she was like maybe just going to ditch Miranda or make a statement about mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, our prediction was she could maybe find a way to 
start posting content again and like kind of regain kind of the trust of her like you know diehard fans ride or die fans but I didn't expect her to address toxic gossip train and if she's going to address it it's also bizarre that it still exists like she didn't take it down she's saying like that was really immature of me um and you know my ego got in the way but it still is there making money for her it is her most viewed video to this day so I actually felt like if she was going to address it, she needed to properly address it. Like putting an apology at the beginning of a vlog. I know. Briefly just felt really jarring. It did feel kind of vulnerable. I felt like watching it, but then the transition felt really jarring. Like I yeah. think the way, you know, it didn't feel like it was scripted necessarily, which, you know, some creators like Adam have mentioned that is in fact a carbon copy like copy paste of previous apologies Mm. that she has made so I don't know I feel like I have a lot of different thoughts now after you know listening to Adam's reaction to it yeah watching the content of the vlog after was so transparently like wholesome like I just thought it was so funny like how obvious she was like clearly trying to be like look I was just out here trying to be a mum for the last five months come and look at my chickens and these these eggs that I make myself and you know I like it's just we live this really like cutesy kind of life like ignore all the fact that I did all these terrible things before yeah a hundred percent I mean any apology would have been better than toxic gossip train so I'll give her that that is what I will give her yes like at least she you know has revisited it in some way although like yes. that's very little consolation at this point yes a couple things a she posted this video right before like literally a week before youtube adsense explodes and gets you know the highest that it's going to be in the entire year because it's leading up to christmas so that's a very convenient time to come back mm-hmm. the weirdest thing sorry before i keep going the weirdest thing ever ever is yesterday morning before she'd posted this video, I was scrolling TikTok in the morning and I saw a girl, she made a video. It was like pretty viral. And she said, my Roman empire is Colleen Ballinger. Like, what is she doing now? How is she going to come back? How will she recover from this? Whatever. And then literally 20 minutes later, Colleen posted. It was the weirdest coincidence that I have experienced in a really long time that I saw that video and then she posted. Oh my God. But anyways, that was like a bit of an aside. So yes, doing this whole thing before YouTube AdSense explodes is really interesting. Adam in his response video Mm -hmm. also made the point that you get demonetized after six months of inactivity. Mm -hmm. And then Adam also made some interesting points that she posted it on a Saturday night Mm -hmm. and Adam himself couldn't make a reaction video because he was like out clubbing with his friends. He was like, that seems like an interesting choice, the timing of it all. Um, He mentioned that there was potentially some strategy involved with the fact that all the entertainment journalists were kind of off shift for Mm -hmm. the weekend. Um, He also messaged. Except for us. Yeah, we got that article up, babe. News never stops for the centennial, for (laughs) the hungover centennial team. Um, Lauren did give me yesterday off. She's like, I will prep viral news (laughs) and I have a Colleen Melanger story to write. So just like sit in however you feel and I've got you today. Thank (laughs) God with the timing of it all. Um, Adam also mentioned that Joshua David Evans is new wife yeah it's her birthday yeah it was her birthday as well so he was like I don't know if all those things are tied together it seems like incredibly even coincidental that those things kind of lined up but it is interesting to think about paired with the demonetizing threat paired with the AdSense timing of it all yeah it was just not a very long time to be offline no given the scale of what happened and the scandal and how many different accounts of you know different young fans but also people that worked with her like there were so many accusations and stories that came out following Adam and Cody and Becky and Ollie speaking out that Mm -hmm. were like not even really related to her fan relationships, but just like her work ethic and what it's like to be, I don't know, even Joshua David Evans, what it's like to be in a relationship with her. Mm. Like so many things have transpired. And in this apology, quote unquote, she did not address anything. No, it was kept super, super vague, super high level. It was maybe only like two and a half, three minutes as part of a 13 minute vlog. Like she didn't give it time even if she wanted to address anything specific she didn't but I don't know what she would address like there's so many things like where do you even start like it needed to be like uh, at least half an hour like full sit down here's all the things that I'm like acknowledging taking accountability for and apologizing for but Adam was saying too that because it was blanket it almost felt worse than nothing 
because yeah. there was just no like recognition for any individual like acts that she'd committed that had hurt people. Yeah. So some of Colleen's accusers have shared their thoughts mostly on X, but like we said, Adam did make a YouTube video addressing it. So Becky has been tweeting a lot about it. For anyone who doesn't remember, Becky was the fan that Colleen pulled on stage at a show while Becky was a teenager. She had Becky lay on stage on her back and she like pulled her legs open and Becky was in a skirt. So like the whole audience could see her. It was just a very violating moment for Becky. So some things that Becky has tweeted in response to this, she wrote literally shaking and crying. I can't handle this right now. I have no interest in watching it. I literally had another nightmare about Colleen and her family last night. I have just started to work through this in therapy. I probably sound so dramatic to people right now, but I can't handle this again right now. And then she also tweeted, I don't know if I was Colleen and I was sorry, I would probably delete the ukulele video and donate all the money from it. That's just me though, trying to apologize while that video making fun of grooming and fart jokes is still up. Girl, what are you doing? And I think that's what it is. At first, I was maybe giving her too much benefit of the doubt. I assumed she had kept the ukulele video up because she was, it was a way of like holding herself accountable. Mm. Like, you know, removing the video is an easy way I don't know. At the time, this is what I thought when she was saying like that was such an embarrassing video. And then I saw that it was still up. I thought, okay, well, maybe she's keeping it up because she wants to, you know, she doesn't want to shy away from what she did and the embarrassment that she made of herself. But the fact that Adam was like, that is the most like highly watched video on her channel. That's making her the most money. That's why she's not taking it down. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, of course. Yeah, hundred percent. A lot of people too were saying, you know, cost of living, like it's just reached a point where she can't afford to not make money anymore. That's why she's come back. Well, and also Adam made the point and obviously, you know, we're not in the weeds of like their personal relationship. This is recounting, but Adam's made the point that she's working with the same lawyer mm. that Prince Andrew and Army Hammer worked with with, which mm-hmm. obviously they were accused of like some pretty heinous crimes. So I feel like as well that A is like her increases, um, her expenses are increasing, but B, she's been trying really hard to keep people quiet Yes, instead of, you know, making those connections with her fans or people that she's hurt and like being able to apologize and like rebuild a relationship in any meaningful way and take accountability for that. So I think knowing as well what's going on behind the scenes and Mm. that she's spending that money to like try and like shut people up about the stories that have come out yeah is also like kind of telling of the fact that she's not really trying to take accountability and move on yeah Adam was also like she just likes people talking about her she doesn't care in what capacity at this point you know if it keeps the views going up and it keeps the money coming in like whatever and I was like okay that's a lot but Yeah. yeah I it could be a reason for her coming back not really addressing it moving on I think everyone should watch Adam's reaction video because it actually like I had like a visceral reaction to it, even though obviously we know this story so well. It is so just with the way that news moves and, you know, her being quiet for so long and kind of glossing over the accusations. It is easy even for us to like forget the scale of the accusations and the harm that she caused and watching Adam's video saying point blank, she groomed me Mm. like this woman groomed me and here's how I feel about it. Mm. And here's why you should not watch her. Here's why it's not okay. It was almost like confronting to me again, to be like, Oh yeah. Like I actually forgot how fucking serious this was. 100%. I felt the exact same way. Like when I watched Colleen's apology, I felt very differently to how I felt after watching Adam's. Like it really reminded me as well of like, you know, listing off all the people that she should have apologized to by name or recognized by name and the damage that she had done. Adam kind of bringing that back up and like summarizing it again was like, Oh yeah, the internet moves so fast. I completely forgot about this and we were we were in the weeds so I think it is really easy to um to disregard and just yeah. be like oh okay she, yeah she's apologizing now she's trying to take accountability it's like oh no there's so much she just completely didn't acknowledge at all yeah and the way she's trying to downplay everything and even in toxic gossip train you know just being like not a groomer just a loser and it, it is those little moments that even when you're in the weeds of it it does slowly start to sway your judgment of the situation. And I didn't realize that it was doing that or like that that was occurring to me until I watched Adam's video. Yeah, completely. It's just like softens over time because the parts that stick in your brain and maybe Toxic Gossip Train was like strategic in that way. It's like, I remember lines like that 
and it, it, it reframes the way that you think about it. And you don't want to believe that there are people out there who do have access to children who are like intentionally acting like this or doing these things to them. Like you do want to believe that Colleen at the end of the day thought she was literally just becoming friends with these people and didn't realize how bad it was. But then to see how she has handled this shows me that she, maybe she didn't know what she was doing at the time, but she doesn't give a flying fuck now. 100%. That, that's what she did. Oh my God, you're actually like articulating the thoughts that I was having in the car on the way here being like, how could you not be like as mortified as we all feel about what's gone down? Yeah. And it's not coming through in anything that she's put out that she feels that way, that she is has the reaction that she should have when she realizes the impact that she's ha had on these people. Yeah. Like even if for some reason in her own brain, she didn't think that like talking about her sex life with a 13 year old was inappropriate. Sending Trisha Paytas's nude photos to minors mm. was inappropriate. Whatever her behavior was, even if in the moment she did not realize how inappropriate that was as like a 30 something year old woman now after these past five months how is that still how you're quote unquote taking accountability like you clearly just don't give a shit yes because yeah there's no way that you can kind of move forward the way that you are if you like appreciate yeah. the severity of what has happened over the last number of years yeah well and then Adam made the point too she's only she only left the group chats like a month a couple of months ago I know and she hasn't personally according to the accusers, reached out to any of them, hasn't spoken to Adam. He should be the number one first person she's talking to, yeah. like messaging him and, you know, having a chat with him about everything that went down. Well, and if you are so worried about the way you're perceived, like court of public opinion, like is Adam not the first one you would want to kind of smooth things over with or at least, you know, have that conversation about where you're both at and take accountability because Adam's also going to tell everyone mm -hmm. if that's happened or not. So mm -hmm. at least like give yourself a chance for, you know, if that's... If that's all you care about yes. is like what you look like in the public eye. Yes. That would have been strategy number one. Yeah. Like every step has been confusing. Yeah, I agree. So Ollie has also spoken out. Ollie was a former fan who accused Colleen's brother, Trent Ballinger, of using his proximity to Colleen to foster an inappropriate relationship with Ollie when he was a teen. So Ollie tweeted, quote, I would have at least liked her to be less vague with her apology and address specific issues. You can't just apologize for everything once once, you know, someone named Emily tweeted, I genuinely think the money has started drying up. And with the cost of living, that's what she had to do. Come back. At least that's my running theory. And Ollie quote tweeted that and said also the fact that if your channel is inactive for five months or something, then you stop making money and it was getting pretty close. So that's what Adam was saying is like the sixth month of it all. Mm -hmm. And then Swoop, who is a YouTuber that has been interviewing Colleen's victims and creating documentary style videos about the situation. She tweeted about Colleen's lack of acknowledgement for the victims, writing something Something Colleen forgot to mention, the names of those whose lives were hurt. Adam, Becky, Oliver, Joshua, Alex, Soph, Ella, Bella, April, the fans, and so many others. Let's keep them in our warmest thoughts and lift them up as they continue to process their individual timing. Yes, completely. And I do think Adam mentioned as well, um, the timing is that they kind of, I mean, Adam specifically made a video a few days ago about how he is feels like he's actually doing really well with everything that mm. he's gone through and he's been seeing like a therapist that specializes or a psychologist that specializes in like childhood trauma and he was saying like how much better he's doing mm. and so he's like for this to kind of come out a couple of days later like it is just really stressful timing and I'm sure everyone's so overwhelmed when they felt like they maybe have just started to get a handle on like mm -hmm. how to process everything and they have been like you know everyone's been able to come together and share their experiences and start working through them in their own ways and then for this to kind of it feels like a bit of a slap in the face yes. for all these people that have just started processing how they feel about it and publicly doing so mm -hmm. yeah so classic Colleen at this point yeah I guess she's just back yeah like I guess there's probably not much else that's going to be said about this on her channel in her content yeah I think she'll just keep posting now and move on yeah. and it will just be like in her eyes like normal she probably will never go on tour again it will just go away which is like the fucked part yeah it will and if she's ditched Miranda which she hasn't made like you know any claims about yet but that was our prediction of mm -hmm. how she's going to move forward is she just said she's retiring the Miranda character she won't have the capacity like her career will change yeah she will have to lean into kind of different kinds of content and for that reason I think people will just be able to like separate like yeah. a new and old Colleen and she'll find new fan bases of you know maybe mums following her for like mum content that 
don't have any awareness of her past even. So yeah, we'll see how I that agree. goes. I agree. Okay, so the next story is that Lil Tay has finally spoken on the bizarre death hoax that took over mainstream media um, a few months ago. So Lil Tay did a feature interview with Rolling Stone this week and it was her first interview since her like a viral death hoax, which sounds insane to say in a sentence. Yes. But in August, widespread reports about the passing of Lil Tay and her brother Jason started circulating across the internet. So Lil Tay first skyrocketed to virality in 2018 for her outrageous online persona. At the time, she was around 11 years old and made videos flaunting her lavish lifestyle. Later that year, she mysteriously vanished from the internet amid a bitter custody battle between her parents, Angela Tiana and Christopher Hope, only to re-enter the cultural zeitgeist upon the news of her alleged death. So Tay now has musical aspirations and sat down with Rolling Stone to open up about her career. And in the interview, she alleges that the hoax was organized by her now estranged father as a, quote, last resort to sabotage her. So for anyone that doesn't remember... Basically, in August, there was all these reports that she had died. She and her brother had died, right? Yes. People were posting on her official Instagram account. Oh, yes. Saying that she had died. And all these mainstream publications picked it up. And then there were a few internet culture journalists who were looking at these posts and like kind of knew the lore around Lil Tay and were just questioning Mm. because nobody could verify this. And then there was a BBC reporter who had come out and wrote an X thread about how they verify deaths and they did not write about this because they tried to verify the death mm. and explained all the steps they go through and they couldn't verify it. Yeah, but so many it really um opened everyone's eyes. It was a it was actually a massive moment for, you know, responsible reporting especially when it comes to the creator economy and how the landscape of media has changed in an effort to be the first ones yes. to publish news. Like that really was a wake up call for a lot of mainstream publications especially ones that have only started covering internet culture kind of in recent years, like Mm -hmm. kind of jumping on that bandwagon, recognizing that people care about creators as much as, you know, Mm -hmm. we have tried to bring gravity to. So I think it really um, opened people's eyes to the fact that processes like do need to be followed. But since that all went down and people recognized that they'd made a mistake in reporting on her death because she was in fact alive, there has been constant speculation about Tay's relationship with her father and many believe he was physically and emotionally abusive to her as a child. So she, this is a conversation that kind of people have been having on the down low for a couple of years, uh, but this kind of has come to a head recently with A, the viral death hoax and then B, kind of her hiatus on social media over the years. So Tay also blamed her five-year absence from social media on her father, noting that she was, quote, very unmotivated and depressed during this time. So her father denies the allegations leveled against him, claiming that, quote, somebody has a strategy that a good way to get publicity is to make accusations against me. They are all false. So many online users also harbor suspicions about Tay's older brother, questioning whether he was quote, coaching her and exploiting her for viral fame, accusations that Tay herself refutes. Uh, She told Rolling Stone in the interview, I am the one that's always wanted to become famous. I was the one who had a vision for myself as an artist and I made it happen. And of course he helped me. And then ever since her mother won the custody battle, Tay and her team have been working to fulfill her dreams of pop stardom. So she said, I always had a vision of myself becoming famous. It was something I always wanted to do and I just spoke it into reality. And then late September, she released her first song titled Sucker for Green. And the video clip is like really taking me back to a different era of like pop culture. I feel like it feels so cartoony. Um, Do you remember that Lily Allen video clip? I can't remember what the song was for, but there is a Lily Allen video clip that it's a lot more sexual in nature because Lily Allen was like kind of that kind of artist uh, and but, an adult <laughs> and an adult but you know it's very like showy it almost feels like comical like mm-hmm. I can't tell whether she's trying to lean into a stereotype or whether like this is just the vibe that she's going yeah, for yeah 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 I mean I think the story around Lil Tay is very sad I do believe that it is a story of a child being exploited for fame and followers and money by her Mm. dad and her brother. There's always been an element of like kind of AI about her too. Like I think people were really confused (laughs) like with the AI influences and stuff too. Like 
it, she just sat in this unique position where I think people have always been a little bit confused about her presence because it, especially starting so young. Yeah. Like I feel like there's so much awareness around, you know, now – what age you let kids get social media accounts, you know, for fear of them mm -hmm. being exploited or getting wrapped up in things they shouldn't be wrapped up in or being exposed to things they shouldn't be exposed to. So the fact that she has been an influencer since she was so young mm -hmm. has always confused people. I think people don't know like what category to put her in. Like this Rolling Stone interview was actually really interesting and unique insight because I think before mm -hmm. then we feel like we've never really known who she is. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, like even when you hear child stars be like, no, I wanted to, you know, I begged my parents to let me do acting and stuff. It's like kids don't get famous at 11 by themselves. There are parents that are pushing them just as hard into the limelight. And obviously we talk a lot about like influencers and creators and keeping your kids offline and where kind of the laws should lie with that. And Lil Tay is a true cautionary tale of that. She's just like an influencer, like a social media example of like child stars being exploited by their parents, like celebrities. Yeah, completely. And I think that sometimes we, um, when you do read things like this and you can see it transition, like if this does successfully transition into a career, you know, it is different kind of from the Evely LeBrant situation of it all because she is like the face behind it. She can present the messaging in some type of way. Like there's mm -hmm. no one around her that we can like immediately blame that's also public like I think yeah. with Everly and releasing her song it also still felt like quite childlike whereas little Tay has now little Tay little Tay <laughs> um, has released this song and if she transitions this into a mainstream musical career mm. people might almost forget about the trajectory and the way that she became famous and also it might become a way that people look at now and like want to replicate that for other kids yeah, like getting the virality first. Yeah, because that feels like more accessible. But then transitioning that into like a proper musical career, people will be like, okay, yeah, well, that's the path now, which is really terrifying yeah. to like see that as an example if she does become successful. And you don't want her to like not be successful, but also it kind of either way, it's yeah. kind of bad. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think it's good that she's moving away, hopefully putting this kind of death hoax to bed because that was fucked. Yeah, and was I cannot fucked. imagine being her and having her father and brother kind of orchestrate something like that. That mm. would just be so difficult. Yeah, it would be so difficult. And when it does transition into, you know, a mainstream career and there is less of an expectation about like sharing parts of your life, like it is just – you don't have that like insight anymore about like how she's coping with it or True. how she's dealing with it. Like then all of a sudden she like goes behind the curtain of mm -hmm. celebrity PR and you just like don't know what the future what's looks happening. like then. Like, yeah. What's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. That viral death hoax though was the sign that things are truly unwell with her. So yeah, that was pretty rough. Yeah. The next story is that Travis Kelsey has deleted several unwholesome posts as Swifties dig up his old tweets. So it seems that the guy on the Chiefs is getting some bad karma. I had to include that. I had to. <laughs> Annabelle wrote that sentence for our sub stack and I was like, I got to say that. <laughs> Amid this seemingly perfect love story between Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, Swifties are doing a background check and on the internet, that means a scroll through his ex profile. So with tweets dating as far back as 2010, many ex-users found themselves amused by Travis's early internet humor and his occasional spelling mistakes and his enthusiasm for nap time. His tweets are really cute. We have a carousel of them on Centennial. I posted them before I saw that there was some unproblematic ones. And this is my bad because honestly, people were all over Twitter being like, these are amazing tweets to like resurface. Like, can you imagine his, you know, delight when he sees that his old tweets are getting dug up and everybody's like happy to see them instead of being canceled over them. And I was like, true, true, true. And then literally 20 minutes after I posted this carousel, all the bad tweets came out and I was like, fuck. <laughs> Isn't it so crazy though? Like, literally every single thing is too good to be true like there is yes. never never like we can't just have something like wholesome to enjoy I also think Travis Kelsey like he is not a creator I'm sure as we can see like not traditionally chronically online yeah this man probably doesn't even know that people dig up tweets that are problematic <laughs> like he's just like doing his sports thing yeah didn't even think about it because you know like if a creator blows up now like mm -hmm. someone like yeah. Tinks had those tweets resurface like would you not go and do a cull 
straight away. Yeah. But I genuinely just don't think he's even in a realm where it's anything he's ever thought about in his life. I also think part of it when it comes to creators and their old tweets coming up, it's like, yes, the internet was definitely very different in like 2009 to like, you know, 2013 or whatever. Don't get me wrong. Some of the tweets we've seen, some people's past tweets are so racist and vile. And like, that was not the culture online back then. But I understand that some of the things that we have seen like toe the line of like the weird satirical humor, like the kind of like mean, nasty satirical humor Mm. that used to actually be popular back then. Oh, totally. We talk about it quite often that the culture on the internet Mm -hmm. was like really mean. Yeah. Like it was funny to be mean. Like that was the, you know, meme culture of the 2000s, like early, early 2010s. Yeah. So like I understand it is a different vibe, but I just think a lot of creators – don't actually remember the shit that they were tweeting back then. Mm. They don't think that they probably tweeted such bad shit because there would be such a difference. I mean, possibly for some of them between their like 20, 2009 self to 2023 self. And you've grown. So Mm. you don't, you're not sitting out here being like, oh my God, I can't believe I had that thought in 2009. Like like not realizing you probably like documented that thought when you had that thought. Yeah, exactly. People evolve. But, but you know, with Travis, it's interesting because he was in his early twenties at that time. Yeah. He wasn't 14. No, exactly. So anyways, let's get into the tweets. So as Travis's old tweets began circulating online this weekend. Internet sleuths started documenting some of his ableist, misogynistic, and fat shaming posts. In these tweets, Travis referred to certain women as ugly, commented on what should be considered an appropriate weight for women, and even dropped a slur when talking about someone with an intellectual disability. So these posts were collected for the most part on the faux moi subreddit before they were deleted from his ex profile. And I should have known that something was going down because I was liking some of the quote tweets that people were posting of his old tweets. Like I thought I thought were funny. Yeah. And then I went back to screenshot some of them for the post that I was making the carousel. And I noticed that like the quote tweets were still there, but the tweet that I had seen like five minutes before was gone. So I was like, it's weird that Travis or someone on his team is deleting these tweets. Like they're so wholesome and the internet loves him. And then. And then. And then. Okay. So I'm going to read some of the tweets. If you guys don't want to hear them, because again, like I said, they're kind of, there's a lot of like fat shaming and all of that. Um, I will put a timestamp in the description to skip ahead. Okay, so tweet number one, he writes, I got to get out of here. It's too weak. I'm getting attacked by ugly girls. He wrote, as a man, you have something wrong with you if you're going for girls that weigh more than you. Another one, he said, at Reg Run 11, they slow as hell because their parents have been talking to them like they were our word since they were babies. Another tweet says, damn, the Clippers girls got to be the shitty girls that don't make the Lakers girls team because they were all ugly. Another tweet says, ha ha, I just caught myself judging every person that walked past me, whether they were ugly, fat, funny looking, sexy, ha ha, I'm tripping. And then another, ha ha, when fat people fall, it's like slow motion entertainment because they never just fall. They always tumble and gradually hit the deck. Okay, Travis. Hashtag comedy. Hashtag comedy. On the last one, so. No. And nothing is going to happen to him because like you said, he's not a creator. He does not rely Mm. on fan income Mm. and being, you know, well liked or having a fan base. Well, and the people that have typically paid his bills, football fans Mm -hmm. aren't probably on a part of this discourse, you know, like I think for the most part, like in from a mainstream American celebrity athlete, like they're not the people that are, you know, looking out for a cancellation moment the same way that like Taylor Swift's, kind of fan base is a lot younger, like more likely to be online. And obviously that could be like a massive stereotype. But yeah, I just, I don't think they had existed in the same realm until previously. And he could just go back to his job if he needed to and yeah. like separate himself from all of this kind of discourse. Yeah. Although I guess he does have a podcast, which kind of puts him in like the public sphere. But aside from mm. that, you know, like all of his sponsorships and podcasting and whatever, like his NFL career will be fine. Mm -hmm. I am sure that this is tame in comparison to what a lot of football players were tweeting back then. A hundred percent. But yeah, so of course there's like two sides to it. Some people are like really shocked by this and upset and, you know, saying, I can't believe Taylor Swift's team didn't like look into this, whatever. I mean, that is more surprising to me that her team didn't look into it. I know, but like she dated Maddie Healy, who was like 
in my opinion, way more problematic. In your opinion? No, he is like the most okay, problematic yes. man in the world. I mean, yes, yes, I know. <laughs> he's like saying this now. Like in 2023, yeah, he's saying shit more unhinged than this publicly on podcasts. Like yes. he is literally fucked. Yes. <laughs> but then of course there's other people that were like, this is 13 years ago. The internet was different. The vernacular was different. But yes, so we will keep you guys posted. I have seen very little coverage on this. The only mainstream article, at least this weekend, that was covering this was Daily Beast. I, I was sure it was kind of public knowledge at that point or people were starting to see about it, mm-hmm. but no one was covering it and it did feel like it was intentional. I think mm-hmm. for a couple of days, I think people were waiting to see what the reaction was, if anyone else picked it up because, you know, maybe um, – E! News didn't pick it up, like Mm -hmm. people didn't pick it up, like Us Weekly, there was like an understanding that like let us have this wholesome moment on the internet without, you know, it turning sour as things so often do. I think that's part of it, but I also wonder if we're getting like old tweet fatigue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder if people are feeling like, you know, he was a different person 13 years ago or just in general public figures. Like we need to give people some grace. I don't know. I also think from a media perspective too, it could be really interesting because typically for us, bad news tracks better than good news. Like Mm -hmm. it gets more clicks, it gets more traffic. Like that is just the nature of, you know, being in media and journalism, which is unfortunate. But I think Taylor and Travis were quite unique. Like everyone was so happy yes. that she was happy that I think good news was actually doing really well. Yeah. So I think too, maybe like they didn't want to burst that bubble. Like good news was getting so much traction mm-hmm. that it wasn't worth bringing up the bad news for the sake of the bad news because like for them, her Swifty traffic was paying the bills anyway, right? Yes, yes. So maybe, yeah, that also had something to do with it. But I think, yeah, that's definitely like a valid point. So the next story is that Kim Kardashian has, of course, caused an uproar as the GQ Man of the Year cover star. So obviously Kim was named one of GQ's Men of the Year, which she announced on Instagram. She graced the magazine's cover as more specifically Tycoon of the Year, posing in a tie with a bag of Cheetos. I really liked this shoot. I thought the shoot was awesome. Yeah. I just think it was so nice to see Kim. Like it was done incredibly. Mm-hmm. It was just like it felt very fashion in a way mm-hmm. because she wasn't trying to be sexy, normal Kim Kardashian. And mm-hmm. then I also think it was just – refreshing to see Kim like not hypersexualized and just like looking yeah I don't know I thought it was interesting uh, she was joined by Chris and Courtney and Chloe for the interview which covered everything from skims to her family to her late father Robert Kardashian she also discussed her divorce from Kanye she said quote you want to be sensitive because they're just kids and it's hard to go through no matter what age you have to make sure that you only go to a level that they can understand and it's okay to show a vulnerable side but you never go to a negative side so the interview was great. It was a lot of insight into, you know, the business prowess that we've seen her kind of become a bit more known for recently. But there has since been a wave of outrage at the publication for including Kim on the man of the year list, on this year's man of the year list. So someone wrote, help me understand why she is on the cover of a men of the year edition. So being a successful business person is a quote unquote male trade. Weird. Another shared quote. I just feel like this is taking away from the successful men, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is why America is now laughed at around the world. Absolutely freaking embarrassing. Okay, that is the funniest take I've ever yes. had in my whole life. Thank you for bringing that <laughs> to our attention. <laughs> However, it is important to note that the magazine does not explicitly specify the gender of those featured on the list. So instead, it defines the honorees as individuals, quote, from entertainment, fashion, and sport who have made 2023 a year to remember. So ma- no matter which side of the debate you fall on, if you think that, like, women should be included in that or not it's important to note that this year is actually far from the only time GQ has put a woman on their men of the year list so Jennifer Aniston was actually the first woman to appear on the cover of GQ's men of the year issue back in 2005 10 years after the magazine started doing the list and this was off the back of her breakup from Brad Pitt when he'd already moved on with Angelina Jolie and people really liked seeing this huge publication support her in this way and since then there have been several women on the list so 
in 2011, a Man of the Year cover went to Mila Kunis. Rihanna was featured as GQ's Man of the Year in 2012. Shailene Woodley made the list in 2014. Gal Gadot made the list in 2017. Serena Williams was on the cover in 2018. Jennifer Lopez in 2019. And rapper Megan Thee Stallion was in the mix in 2020. So obviously no one is as controversial as Kim. Mm -hmm. And this has like become way more divisive because of the fact they chose her. They chose her, but like, whatever. It's great press for GQ. I reckon True. she looked amazing. Like, I don't know if anyone. I didn't know this background of having women included. Yeah, yeah but, but that's that's why because Kim is so divisive. Like, no matter how you feel about Kim, like anything she does is going to get backlash. Yes, completely. Um, but I hundred percent think. If we're looking at that category of influence, of course she yes. deserves to be on the list. Like yeah. I'm surprised it hasn't happened sooner. Yeah. And I think the move from GQ was like purely strategic. Like everyone is talking about this cover. Like I didn't know yeah. that any of these other women were on the list because they also don't have the... Yeah, like the influence or power that she has. Yeah. So I think it's significant. I think she looks amazing. Love everything about it. Have Except Rihanna. Know. Sorry. Rihanna definitely has the influence and power yes. <laughs> that Kim has. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I have no for further thoughts on that, except I think it's hilarious that it's embarrassing for America and <laughs> that she's taking opportunities away from men. Lol. Okay, random man. We got a comment. I actually ended up deleting this TikTok. So I made a TikTok of us talking about Kylie's, what's it called? Kai, her brand. Mm -hmm. Talking about how we wished, you know, that she had gone the actual luxury route. It was just a clip from the podcast. If you guys watch our TikToks or whatever, you'll know. So I posted this and it started to get some traction and somebody commented saying, this is the most toxic woman hating podcast, especially towards the Kardashians. And that comment literally cut like a knife. Like we get so many hate comments on TikTok. Like this is like the furthest thing from like the first hate comment that we've ever received or the meanest comment we've ever received. But somebody calling us toxic and woman hating I was like that is actually the opposite of what we're trying to be and it felt like just a fucking dagger and then I was like you clearly don't actually listen to our podcast no because then you would know that we love the Kardashians even though we can understand and recognize that they are problematic queens yes like 90% of the time we are more Kardashian apologists than we should be yes but also respect what they have done you know from a business perspective mm -hmm. from a reality tv to mainstream culture pipeline like it is so funny and that is kind of the risk that you take when we use TikTok and TikTok has been amazing for our growth but we also are very aware of the fact that every single thing we put on TikTok comes with the risk that people don't have the background context yeah. and they probably will never listen to the podcast mm -hmm. if they're leaving a comment like that so we just need to like let it roll off our back but I can I understand <laughs> Lauren would die on a hill for the Kardashians um, and you know I've come to that conclusion over the years of doing this too. <laughs> that it felt particularly like poignant. Yeah. I was like, okay, that is so fucking far from the truth. And I felt like, I, I think that's an important aspect. Like it, we would be an unsuccessful pop culture podcast in terms of hosting if we did not look, try and look at all sides of the argument when it comes to stories that we're reporting on, like, yes, I might have an affinity for the Kardashians. I might love their show. I might like following them on Instagram, mm -hmm. whatever, but I would be a very bad pop culture journalist if I couldn't also recognize my bias yeah. and, you know, give them shit when I think they deserve it. But I did not let that roll off my back. And <laughs> so I deleted the TikTok. <laughs> You were, I was like, I can't deal with this right now. You were in the weeds of the comments last week. At the end of the week, she was messaging me being like, look at this comment. I'm like, stop looking at the comments. I know. I don't know what it was. Like last week was a particularly like anxiety inducing week. I mean, we had a few videos go viral, which I think always does not help. Yes, <laughs> completely. And it also came off the back of the Emma episode. And I think yeah. that left us very on edge because same thing. We didn't want it to look like we were coming for Emma. We were yeah. trying to give her, you know, all the credit in the world for what she's done for the creator economy while still being like providing a balanced argument, yeah. providing both sides. But I think we were like on edge about how that was going to be received because we never want to be seen as woman <laughs> hating. That's insane. No. Oh my God. Toxic and woman <laughs> hating. You guys. I'm dead. Speaking of women hating no. Oh my god. <laughs> no, we hate men, you guys. Although if I you listen to, to this, you know. I went to a bumble dinner. Um, they revealed their 2024 dating trends on Thursday night last week. 
and they were telling, you know, everyone kind of gets the mic at a point during these dinners and they try and make it really interactive. They always have just really interesting, smart people in the room, which like, you know, thank you for inviting (laughs) us normally. We get invited. And everyone kind of shared their experiences with dating or, you know, like in relation to the trends that they were revealing. And Lucille picked up the mic Uh, after someone had like spoken and she was like oh my god guys it's okay like we don't hate men like I don't want anyone to think we hate men like it was just like a funny story but she was like all the journos in the room just want you to know like we're just speaking like in a funny way and I wanted to be like no but sometimes we do we hate men yeah (laughs) not the men that listen to this podcast no we love you guys broadly (laughs) that's the sentiment broadly we hate men obviously We're scared of them. (laughs) Okay, the next story is that the BFFs podcast is facing backlash for their reaction to a viral TikTok about working nine to five. So last month, a girl named Brielle Acero went viral when she posted a TikTok crying and talking about how difficult it is to adjust to working nine to five post-college, especially when most of her college experience was at home during COVID. She's blonde. She has really big eyelashes. I'm sure you guys all saw this video. It was so viral at the time. In this video, she said, quote, nothing to do with my job at all, but just like the nine to five schedule in general is just crazy. She said through tears in the original video, going on to elaborate that she found herself without the energy to have a life beyond work, largely because of her two hour commute. Her video was picked up by mainstream media globally and used by right wing pundits to bash Gen Z, like Fox News, who called the Gen generation lazy original come on come up with a new adjective for gender yeah, millennials were lazy let's give them something else okay brielle addressed this attention in an interview with rolling stone saying i don't even understand how this has turned into a political argument when all i was trying to do was have an open conversation and be respectful towards people that work even longer hours than i do Now, the BFF's podcast has inserted themselves into the debate. They recapped the TikTok on their podcast, and Dave said, yeah, welcome to the world. And then Brianna Chicken Fry responded saying, I mean, yeah, it sucks, but that's just life. Go do, I mean, go try to make a better job for yourself if you want to. We did it. Okay, you didn't do anything. We don't love Dave. We are not Dave's biggest fans, but Dave built that company from the ground and then like gave the opportunity, passed that along on a civil platter. Yeah. Understandably, people are calling Brianna's comments out of touch, considering she is a very famous and likely, as a result, pretty wealthy influencer. And I want to make it clear, that's not to say that influencers don't work very hard. I mean, we have this podcast because we love creators and influencers. Mm. We recognize that they work very hard. We know the entrepreneurial self-employed grind. I am sure that Dave and Josh and Brianna are working longer hours than nine to five. I'm sure that they are working very long hours. You know, it's a job you can never switch off from when Mm -hmm. you're an influencer. And it comes too with obviously like lots of other layers of facing public backlash. But like you also think that that would mean you would have more empathy instead of like bringing people on or showing people's TikToks then to just like slam them. I would say there is no arguing that influencing is an easier job in terms of the rewards that you get back, the benefits that you get back out of it than, you know, a nine to five or like any other type of job, really, like Mm -hmm. in a lot of industries. And like top tier influencers are making more in a month than Brielle probably makes in a year at her nine to five. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, like when I was first, like, you know, when anyone first starts working full time, like it zaps the life out of you. Yes, it's very exhausting. And also you're like learning so much. I don't think that's taken into account enough. Like, Yes, there's a commute. Yes, you're learning how to like quite often live out of home for the first time properly. Like it's not a college life where you can get away with it. Like you're actually trying to like take care of yourself in some meaningful way. Um, You're commuting, but you're also learning how to behave in a corporate environment. You're learning a ton of new skills because you're like learning how to do a new job. Mm -hmm. So I think too, like there's a lot of, there's not as much conversation about like how draining emotionally and mentally learning step by step how to behave in a complete new environment that you know that you're probably going to be in for the next 40 years yes what that toll is going to take on you and that's the conversation that you know fucking all these adults that we're having I know that Brielle's an adult but she's 21 that all of these adults that have been in the workforce for a long time should have been having as opposed to just branding her as lazy and entitled and not wanting to work they should have been taking this and you know 
had a moment of empathy, self-reflection, and open that conversation about how difficult the transition is between college or school and the workforce. Because it is fucking exhausting. Yeah, it is. And it's also insane because at the same time, everywhere around the world is doing trials about a four-day work week because they know how insane it is to expect people yeah. to fit their whole life in a two-day recovery period when they're working five days a week. And, you know, there's spawned a million memes you know spawned a million commentary mm -hmm. pieces about burnout we're so hyper aware of that it's just so funny that like they pick the young girl that made a yes. viral comment to like slander her on behalf of a whole generation when it's not like anybody else is not like having this conversation and you know all you have to add to this conversation if you want to address her and this whole thing is yes it's exhausting but it won't always feel that way like yes. I remember in my first job coming out of university I literally had to go to bed at like 8 p.m every night for like the first several months because you are just so drained mm -hmm. after but then you get used to the schedule you get used to the workplace you get used to like your day-to-day -day, your routine and you adjust to all of that and so it won't feel like that for the next 40 years. Yes. But it's a very valid feeling at that time. And everybody's just like, they're all just on their high horses. Oh, completely. And it is so, I just, I also think that we've come a long way from, you know, telling people that, they have to find their dream job and they'll never work a day in their life. Like I think Gen Z are very pragmatic about the fact that, you know, you work to live, you yeah. afford to do the things that you want to do. You go to work every day so that you can live the life you want to live outside of work. Like mm -hmm. that work-life balance that, you know, was ingrained into millennials that they had to like hustle so hard and mm -hmm. there was no such thing as balance. Like Gen Z are trying to take the power back mm -hmm. in some ways, which is so healthy. Uh, but I also think like staring down the barrel of a 40 year career mm -hmm. and being at the very beginning of that and like not loving what yeah. you do every day. Like it, you, I appreciate that that would feel like an existential crisis yeah. at a point as 100%. well. Yeah, 100%. It's just such a transitional phase in somebody's life. Like I just think it's so small minded of all of these adults that have like fucking come for her. But anyway, so Brielle, <laughs> she responded to Dave and Brianna's comments in a TikTok this week. She said, quote, to say that's life when nobody can afford doctor's appointments. People literally work from the moment the sun rises to the minute the sun sets. You have no idea the struggle that most people in America face. And again, I am sure that Dave and Brianna and Josh could be working those same hours. But like I said, it's really like the astronomical return that they are getting as, you know, the owner of Barstool or as like influencers, mm. business owners themselves is so much bigger than the return that somebody who is working a nine to five gets now. Mm. I mean, to be fair, I didn't see Josh. Like he didn't him. really say anything. Yeah, he's pretty low key, I think, opinion wise in comparison to Dave and Bree. But I do think it's so ironic that Josh was recently on the new season of Selling Sunset, yeah. like buying or selling like houses worth millions of dollars. Yes. And he was talking about like his venture fund and all of that. So to be a part of that conversation, yeah. you are not the same. You are not on the same level as this yes. person that you were then coming for, like and, a power dynamic. And that's what people were trying to say. Like she is not saying I cannot work 40 hours a week for the rest of my life. She is like, if she was making millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars or like felt like she could buy a home with the salary she was making from mm. her 40 hours a week. Like if there was not so much divide, then I think it, we, Gen Z would be feeling more hopeful about the future yeah, and completely. not as existential. I agree. So the BFFs podcast responded to Brielle's TikTok response. <laughs> Brianna said, quote, I don't know, my fucking parents worked doubles and never complained in their lives. And that is what's really rubbing people the wrong way now. Because now in 2023, like the average working person cannot afford basic necessities. They can't afford groceries. They can't afford to go to the doctor, even if they are working 40 hours a week. Mm. It should never be like that. So yes, people are having an existential crisis being like, how am I supposed to do all these things? Like the rewards that I'm getting back, like what I'm getting back for my time is not what it used to be 20 years ago. Yeah, completely. So how do you like make any life decisions around building a family or buying a house or like we'll look at what your future that potentially could look like when you are facing like cost of living crisis like yeah. oh well like I do I do think it it's really showing their privilege it feels so out of touch people shouldn't have to work doubles to be able to afford like basic human needs and I just think their response being like Brianna being like we did as in like we found a job that pays better or whatever makes us happier that is so indicative of 
this, and I'm sure that there is actually a term for it, like a sociological term for it, and I don't know, but this mindset that a lot of very successful people have, it's like the Nepo baby thing, where all of these successful Nepo babies in Hollywood don't want to be branded Nepo babies because they feel like it takes away from the hard Mm. work that they do. Brianna saying, you know, we figured it out. She thinks that because she did it, because she has had this opportunity to build this really amazing career and be so privileged in it just means that like this girl who's crying, Brielle, who's crying on TikTok and hasn't figured it out, like she's just not working hard enough yeah. because Brianna figured it out. Yeah. Like it's just this, it's this mentality that I think people who become successful start to have because they don't want to admit that a lot of their success comes from like right place, right time, luck, privilege, whatever it is. Yeah, totally. And I think, I mean, for us, even like trying to find mentors or people in the business space, doing things that are similar to what we're doing. Like I always, I'm so grateful for people that acknowledge like hundred percent they worked hard. You Mm. don't become successful without working hard, like 99.9% of the time, but also it does come with elements of luck. It comes with an element of privilege you know it comes with right place right time and so anyone that can acknowledge that I think is just like it's um it goes so far Mm -hmm. in like helping people that aren't quite in that position yet and that's all you have to do it doesn't take away from your hard work yeah exactly so yes that that's just another thing to add in the list of bffs being you know (laughs) problematic controversial as they do yeah But thank you so much for listening to this episode, guys. My voice is like kind of made it to the end. I can feel it like just getting a little little bit worse. I'm just like (laughs) ready to go. Ready to go. Uh, But yes, hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to rate, review and subscribe. And we will chat to you guys on Thursday. Bye, guys. Bye.